Hello, I'm going to talk about the Kinefin theory that David Snowden, here it is, weaving sense making into the fabric of our world. So this is a sense making, making sense of the world theory, and we're using it in organizational communication to really understand the process of problem solving, of understanding the dynamics of teams and groups and how to really handle a crisis and it, what it means to have adaptability. For us to start with this lecture, I have to do a little bit of a preamble uh, about uncertainty. Uh, so uncertainty or ambivalence, ambiguity, the unknown. Uh, these are things that we all react to in a lot of different ways. Some people feel a lot more comfortable in change and they find it motivating and dynamic. Uh, these are my, my people who like to uh, move all the furniture around and uh, want to, they find energy in change. And so they're willing to dive into difference a little bit differently. And then I have uh, my high uncertainty individuals who, for different reasons and different experiences, uh, lean much more into predictability and ritual and rhythms uh, that can help predict what is the next thing that's going to happen. But of course, the truth is in the world, the world is random. Uh, we start our day, we have clocks, we have schedules, we might eat the same thing at breakfast. We uh, People like a different levels of order and, and tasks and lists and checklists in order to try to combat the randomness that makes up life, right? And we need both. We need both things. We need there's a polarization of predictability and uh, spontaneity uh, or randomness, uh, and we we need that. We need that both of those, but they obviously can't exist at the same time. So how do we find balance in that? When we're looking at groups of people, like we are in organizations, we're in an organizational communication, and we're trying to understand the ways that communication works in networks uh, from sometimes you have, we right, we talked about all the structures and the subculture groups. How is communication happening informally and formally within the organization that uh, that can lean into the predictability we need of way that communication is going to happen, accountability and responsibility. But then we also need to understand that we can't predict everything. And so then what do you do? And that's where Kinefin steps in. Uh, so I do like to talk about the individual experience of uncertainty, which is why we use movies to try to decipher uh, these different structures we're talking about. Uh, and the movies are really important because we look, one of the things you'll want to do with Kinefin is look at each individual character of how they are approaching the uncertainties. Uh, how are they approaching problem solving? How are they uh, leaning in or what are the choices that they make? And I really want you to focus on that in your movie report that you do for the Kinefin theory as it's unfolding. Okay, so it's just me talking here and I have a lot of different sketches of Kinefin to reference. It kind of has these four different quadrants. Uh, one thing you'll notice about Kinefin theory is that the middle of it isn't exactly like straight across. If it's done correctly, it has this element of curve to it. And that's really to kind of create um, a theory that has um, an element of that life. We can't put a complete straight grid on it, we have to have this kind of organic feeling to the theory for it to really make sense. 
there's a feeling of organicness to it. All right, so when we're looking at those quadrants, let me use my sketch that I have here. There we have an ordered side and an unordered side and the four quadrants. And then there's this kind of, we call it the cliff, the cliff of chaos <laughs> or David Snowden and his friends call it the cliff of chaos. And then in the middle, we have this disorder bucket. Uh, it's often called the disorder bucket. And that's when we're not sure where, where, what goes where. And we kind of have it in this kind of temporary place as we try to problem solve. Uh, and that's the disorder bucket. Over here on this side, with the ordered side, we start in the bottom quadrant. And the bottom quadrant of order is the clear portion of Kinefin, where we are clear, ordered. This is where my checklist and my task-oriented people who need predictability love to live in this quadrant, right? This is where there everything is obvious. That's why we call it clear and orderly. And it has this element of, of what is obvious, meaning that cause and effect has a clear correlation uh, and there's no randomness. Uh, and the reason why we know things have a clear cause effect pattern is because we've done it again and again. There's been this element of repetition. And we've if a problem comes up, we've seen the problem so many times. We know exactly how to approach it. We know exactly how to solve it. And it's probably because we've had that problem thousands of times. Uh, and it's that's why it's clear. That's why there's order. So when you hear a term best practices, what is best practices but the ordered side of Kinefin, right? It's a black and white, which is why I put stripes here. It's very black and white, what to do. It's very clear. And, uh, and we, we know the resources we need. We know um, the, pro the problem and we just do it, right? We just do it. This is sometimes why mentors are really great to help us out because they uh, they have already done what we're trying to do and they can walk us through the steps because they already know the path. Uh, though that doesn't always work, we're going to get into why sometimes a mentor can't walk us through our path. All right. So when we're still on the ordered side of the Kinefin theory, we move into from or, uh, the ordered side to the, the top half here. This is what is considered complicated. Ooh. On this side, we have complex, but on this side of order, we have complicated. And complicated means that we need analysis. We need an expert. We need a mentor. We need expertise and maybe we hit a problem and we we think we might know the answer, but we're not quite sure. We need to have a consultation. We need to consult with someone who is an expert in it. And when we go to that expert, we're going into the complicated, but the expert actually lives in the obvious because the expert has seen the they know how to approach the ambiguity of the issue and fi find the clear path. Now, obviously in complicated, when we're going to an expertise, they've seen the problem before, but the truth is they haven't seen the problem before. They can only approach it by what they know. And your problem has its own context, its own history, and when we go to the expert, a really good expert or mentor is going to be aware that there's a contextual difference to the problem or issue, and they will adapt themselves to that to help solve the problem. So a good consulting group doesn't just come in with their, uh, with their 
template and say, you have to fit their template. They come in with their template and then adjust it to your problem. When we have a consultation group come in that is really missing the mark on helping out, it is because that they are using their template and they don't have any adaptability. So they're really just living in a different version of obvious that isn't helping out the, the problem. That is one of the things you'll find in most of the movies and movies that I've approved um, is that there is this unknown element to a problem that is being faced. And when they're when they bring in the co expert consult, they get information from them, but then they what they're really doing is they're moving it into the adaptation of their specific situation. Uh, so uh, that's something to think about, to look for in your movie, who is coming in with an expertise, but how does it not fit? And how does it get adapted to fit the situation? So if we were to have, if let's say um, we have a problem we're trying to solve in the organization and we are feel like it needs to be in the complicated it part, we've identified that it needs to go to complicated. We have our experts there. We really want to get a group dynamic going where we're questioning the expert and we're adding in the context of the problem in order to build the correct solution for that particular problem. Uh, sometimes this is also happens when some companies or organizations will bring in, um, they rotate management from uh, site to site. Right. Like there's a manager at one site, they come in, they increase productivity, they do a great job and they go, wow, this person, we've identified them as the problem solver. And we have another site here that's really been struggling. We're going to send them over to that site to see if they can solve that problem. And they come in and march in and go, I have solved this problem over here and I'm going to solve yours. You have to, and they start trying to impose all these new rules because they identify themselves as the expert, but what they lack is the ability to adapt. And sometimes they start facing failure or the people, if you've had a manager come in and just start dictating what needs to happen to fix the problem, you're like, well, actually we have a union or we have a contract that limits our ability to do the solution you're talking about. Uh, but then they're like, no, no, that's, then we need to get rid of that contract element of the contract, or we need to figure out how to, because this is the way, this is the expert way to fix it, right? You see how we can end up with tension. So if we get a group of expertise in or a really good super management structure, is going to be listening to the nuance of the group to find out what is the contextual differences. Uh, and then we also, uh, Kneffen says for complicated to really, really work to the next level is you need to bring someone in to those groups who is not an expert, who doesn't really understand the problem or even what's going on. They might be in a completely different group in the organization and you're forming a committee with this uh, consult consultation group. You want someone who doesn't have any expertise because this person becomes valuable to create questions. And we have already covered team dynamics and questioning in class and the importance of questions. Simon Sinek talked about it in the video. Some of you brought that up in your team meeting. Uh, the first team meeting, that video is really important because who's the stupidest person in the room is what Simon Sinek says, actually becomes the most valuable person because they can start pointing to, I don't know what you mean by that, or how would that work in this situation? I don't understand how it applies. And it makes the group stop and move through the explanation in a much more non-jargon or 
simplified way. And then we start to see, oh, actually there's a hole in that. That brings up an issue that we didn't even think of. Where if everybody's an expert, there's a tendency to skip over the nuance of process and the steps that are needed. Okay, still going through. Unordered side now, we're on the unordered side here. Uh, and this would be the side of chaos and complex. So we have chaos and complex side. So in the complex side, uh, the cause and effect is completely disconnected. We had a problem, but we have no idea why we have this problem. And usually we end up in complex because we hit a moment in time of randomness and we call that chaos, right? So we were in chaos, something happened, nobody knew what to do. And now we live in complex because there's no expertise, it never happened before. No one else has seen this problem. We also end up in complex because we don't have any predictability and if we are forming a group, which we would usually call a task force, a task force would form in a complex situation uh, in order to do a full analysis of the moment of chaos, what was the response, what happened, and then it's only through hindsight that we can rewind all the way back before the moment of chaos to see what was the things that led up to that moment. And then what we would do is the task force would start to move into problem solving about the steps, the preamble steps uh, before that moment of chaos in order to start linking cause and effect. And often this takes years. Uh, task force isn't gonna do this overnight or just in a few meetings. Complexity is gonna live in this hindsight place. And we never want a task force that really, um, that's really trying to, in an organization of about seven to 12 people, each of them from different perspectives and points of view uh, with different levels of different understandings of the organizational structure. Uh, from different perspectives, you're going to have people with supervisor positions, but you're going to have people with no super a worker uh, B perspective. With um, and then you're going to bring in those non-expert people, uh, those random people that can keep things questioning. We call that the nativity, the person with the nativity piece. And what you do in the comp, what the group does in the complex is they really start to form hypotheses of why this happened. And then they have to test the hypothesis and they end up with a lot of failure, which is why it takes years. Like, okay, we're going to test this. Was this really what, why it happened this way? Oh, no, no, that couldn't have been it. Then they have to rewind, go back. Uh, find a new causal, uh, a potential causal link. They have to test it, you know, create their hypothesis, test it, fail, test, fail, test, fail. And there's a lot of failure in complex groups, an organization that's really invested in growth and stability will invest in these groups to problem solve in order to make themselves stronger for the next random event or to create that event to no longer be random when they see it again they'll have they can move back into obvious move into best practices of what to do when this happens and that's really the goal so the chaotic piece is complete randomness. It's usually a moment in time. And there's, again, we have that unordered part of the Kinef in here where we can't really make sense of what happens. When we're in a moment of chaos, it is disorder. There's a lot of fear uh, and fear 
can bring a place of freezing. Basically, we start, we freeze when we're afraid and we, we might, this is where chaos tries to move directly over immediately into best practices. Like we're going to just try and fall off. We're going to try and force ourselves up, up the cliff. It, and it's like climbing a, a vertical climb to try and get into order from chaos. And because best practices over here in obvious uh, has created so much predictability and structure, that is the natural place to want to go. But because this is so new, we can't really go off in this way. Now, if someone tries to just move into best practices in a chaotic moment, um, which is what we naturally do, and they start trying to do the things that they would do, this is why there's a cliff here, because the cliff is that we can fall off back into chaos and find even more randomness, more confusion. Uh, and what happens is because there's so much fear, a populist demand in chaos will demand a leadership style uh, that is much more structured, rigorous. We want more rules. We want regulations, almost a dictatorship kind of style. We want that strong leadership that's going to create direction and move us out of this. Uh, so often this becomes a point of manipulation for some leaders to move a group into chaos almost purposefully so that they can take a strong a dictatorial kind of approach uh, to finding the order that they want for their sense of power. Now, if we take some real life experiences um, and use the Kinefin theory, we could look at 9-11, we can look at COVID, the pan COVID-19 pandemic in 2019. Those were moments of chaos, particularly in the COVID example. Uh, we had that moment where we were, the pandemic was sweeping through the globe and a lot of responses was to sh just completely shut down, which is that freeze. We have to freeze. We have to figure out what's happening. We got to keep everyone safe. And that's that we're going to have this kind of like strict rules that you have to wear a mask. You can't leave your house. Uh, everybody has to stay home except for those essential frontline workers. And we got a new definition of what was an essential frontline worker in 2019, as we saw that we needed people to still be getting the food production done and getting food to people, uh, as well as our emergency line workers. In 9-11, it was very clear who was our first responders, the, the firefighters, the police, uh, the military, who um, in the 9-11 we leaned, we tried to get right into best practices of dealing with an emergency event uh, of the terrorist attack, even though we weren't quite sure what had happened at the very first moments. And our first responders moved right into best practices. They storm the Twin Tower buildings, they get right in there, and then we have uh, the ultimate destruction and ultimate moment of tragedy when those buildings come down and we see that best practices didn't work, that it didn't work to go into the obvious realm, that actually we were in a completely random moment we had never seen before. And what did we do? We create, uh, we have our federal government create a task force for the comp and they moved into the complex realm and we get the report, the 9-11 report, we get Homeland Security, we get all of these kind of um, analysis of the chaos to find the cause and effect pieces to try and make sense of that horrific, tragic moment. Uh, when we are in, um, when we're in COVID, we went to complicated. Okay, 
this is a pandemic. We've had a pandemic before in 1918 uh, that also killed millions of people around the globe. Uh, let's go to our pet, our experts in the government who um, have stepped Fauci becomes this kind of person who is the disease expert who uh, was there when AIDS broke out. What did we learn from the AIDS pandemic and HIV, the spread of HIV that could help us now? Um, and unfortunately, COVID-19 was brand new. It had never happened. This is a completely different time. And we also, because of the polarization of politics, it became a narrative war on how we were gonna define what to do in this chaotic moment. Uh, and so the medical expertise um, actually became one of the reasons why we got the vaccine so quickly, uh, why even though we had that first, what was it, about nine months or a year where things were still really living in the chaotic realm, there were those people living in the complicated realm who were, diving in to get this solved as quickly as possible. And you can look at other things, other emergencies or different things that have happened that, or tragic events uh, like school shootings that we can see how the Kinefin theory, um, if people have different reactions on what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And then in the Afterwards, we, we if we're living in the complex, we're still in the debate of what was the cause and effect, what went wrong, how can we have a best practice, how can we make this more obvious so that we know what to do, unfortunately, if it happens ever again. The other parts, I talked about the cl cliff um, and how it works of, of the climbing the cliff up in wanting to climb the cliff into obvious or how we fall from best practices into chaos. Um, and I bet you guys can come up with, y'all can come up with some really amazing examples. The disorder bucket is when we're still trying to decide, is there an expert who can help us or is there a, um, or do, or is, there really no one who can really help us understand this. Maybe we need to move it in complex. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. And when we're in the diagnosing stage, that's when it lives in the disorder bucket. So when you're thinking about your movies um, and how they apply to this uh, assignment that I've created for this Kinefin theory. And this is really like an application to try and practice how to use this. You want to look at each individual character uh, and how they are um, reacting to crisis. Uh, I I think Shaun of the Den is Dead is one of the best movies ever. Um, scripted and edited in its comedy and and horror uh, genres, personally, uh, though there's lots of really great ones. But um, one of the things I think is interesting is Shaun of the Dead is really being, Shaun is trying to figure out how to deal with crisis. It's chaos, and he wants to go to best practices. He wants to go to the Winchester. He wants to go to the bar he always goes to, which is in the very first lines of the movie when he when his girlfriend is breaking up with him she, one of the arguments is no matter what we do we end up at this bar and that's what Sean and his buddy decide that we should be at the bar in this moment of chaos and then trying to get to the bar you can see them climbing the cliff to try and get there and how they just end up in more and more chaos, the more they try to get to the bar. Uh, and, and he has this list. He has this list that they repeat over and over again in the movie. Um, first, we're going to get mom, and then we're going to kill Phil, and then we're going to go to this. And then we're, you know, right? Like they've got this list. They're trying, they're trying so hard to have best practices. And there's a moment when they're not quite at the bar, but they can see it. 
and they um, are trying to figure out how to walk through the streets that are filled with zombies, which almost every zombie genre has a walk through a field of zombies and survive moment. And how do we all know how to do it? You act like a zombie. But Sean realizes he doesn't know how to act like a zombie. And he brings in the the friend who has the theater expertise and she starts doing theater exercises with everyone in the backyard like shake it out let's all breathe let's think what to, about what does zombies want right like they're all in this kind of trying to move into the complicated realm where they're trying to use the expertise of theater to learn how to be a zombie so they can survive and uh they so that's kind of like the thing I'm looking for like where are those little gem moments where we are seeing the expertise part or the randomness part or and really in the end when they're really um trying to decipher what happens where does the complexity live in the movie where they uh, are trying to analyze. And I love that little news report tag at the end where the news reporter is describing what, to, you know, how we will incorporate zombies into our everyday life, right? Uh, and we can, and then there's all these, this kind of um, resolution at the end where you feel like, oh, they've gone through the complexity of understanding cause and effect, and now there's an obvious way of dealing with zombies, and everybody knows now the obvious thing, but that's all in hindsight after they've gone through the complex part. Uh, so that's what I'm looking for when you're doing your analysis, is to really demonstrate that you understand Kinefin and how your movie and your characters are reacting to crisis and solving problems and how do they fit in. I hope that helps a little bit. I do think this is a really difficult theory and you need to set aside some time with your movie and the theory and move into the sketching part of um and you might end up with actually more than one type of Kinefin box to represent your film, or you might end up with one that is um, really uh, a really big one. And I think I put up some examples from former students, I'm trying to see if I can find an, even and get another image out of this book to demonstrate that people, I am expecting you your creativity to kind of come through with it. There's kind of this little one that I really, really like because it has a lot of arrows and it doesn't, it looks um, kind of different in the way that it is. It's It took an overview and kind of created the metaphor of coming down and looking at it like a, like a Google map. <laughs> so I'll be curious how you will demonstrate the your movie. And I'd love to talk to you about it if you want to get into more details. Bye-bye.